What if you use the moon as a memory palace? And not only as one memory palace, but another memory palace, and another memory palace, and yet another memory palace again, as it moves through the sky, hour after hour, or indeed minute after minute. Whatever you choose to use as a positionality of the moon through the sky, as you create multiple versions of the same memory palace again and again and again. We're very honored, and it is a tremendous pleasure, to have Christian books, moons, of Darwin as an example to help us figure out how this might work, which is this painting right here, or painting, I don't know, it's an unfoldable piece of paper. I'm a bit of a coward because I think that if I unfold it, I won't be able to refold it again, so I've left it in its frame. It's signed, and I will say a little bit more about this wonderful piece of art as we go, because it's built from constraint, and that's what the art of memory is, a mental constraint in the mental martial art of your mind. This is part six of the new art of memory here on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. In Thomas, a translation which you can find in the Hermetic Art of Memory in both Latin and English translation, because Lewis Masonic is cool that way, when they put out their books, the great student of Bruno and great memory teacher of his own accord, Alexander Dixon, asks us a very, very fundamental question with wit and with humor. Oh, he says, how absurd this is. There is just one generative process, one time, one world, one eternity. But how many different things have the philosophers asserted that one thing to be? At least they did genuinely reflect upon the subject, unless, of course, they preferred to just spew the whole thing forth. Well, as a kind of wordy fellow myself, I'm a little bit sympathetic to the philosophers and other people who spew things forth. They can't seem to stop themselves. And, you know, Dixon is perhaps like that himself. So he's often making jokes about himself. He's pointing fingers at himself. But we can forgive him because he had an idea for introducing mansions of the moon. I don't know if he actually used this himself as a memory palace technique, but the idea is an exploration of how the celestial bodies, particularly the moon, can be utilized as a mnemonic device that would help you commit information to memory. We're going to rehearse this idea and its implications in full, but to me, Nothing is really more interesting than the ontology behind all of this, which, again, is humorous. There are witty texts. And unlike Bruno, who, you know, cracks some jokes himself from time to time, but usually seems as serious as a sack of nails in his memory training books, Dixon is funny page after page after page. But Dixon is having fun. He's making fun of his lazy memory students. And he's even taking some of the most revered philosophers to task. So he's got dialogues like Plato had dialogues. And he's talking to Socrates in one of these dialogues, or he has a character talking to Socrates. And he says, that friend of yours, Plato, someone whom we around here can hardly stand, even when he's drenched in perfume. So, you know, I don't think Dixon is pointing fingers at other people. He actually begins one of his books with a dedication to the Earl of Leicester, and he admits that he, Dixon, may be yet another fool peddling trifles. And, you know, maybe he's doing this as a rhetorical device so that you'll think he's smarter than Plato and Socrates and all the rest, but I think he's also doing it because he's calling a spade a spade. He knows that some people may think he is suffering vanity. He may be perceived as a pompous ass, and he uses that term for even daring to think he could add anything new to the art of memory. And really, you, you should think twice before you think you could dare to add anything new to the art of memory, because newness in the ontology of many great memory masters, including Bruno, is always of origin original means of origin. And there is a philosophy of pure eminence underlying it all. Now, that's not necessarily their term, but the idea is, is that reality has no second. It is just one thing, and it is spewing forth itself from itself. As Shakespeare 
puts it in Antony and Cleopatra, reality moves with its own organs. Actually, some people think that's a dick joke, but we'll leave it to Dickson to come back from the dead through time to solve that riddle. The point is, is that he's making sure that we know he is playing with the art of memory to rotate it around as if it were a planet in rotation satelliting the sun. And he does this in the other book that is included in the hermetic art of memory called Shadow of Reason and Judgment. And really, I think Dixon delivers. He's pleasant, he's provocative, and often downright hilarious. His provocations rattle off like preemptive strikes. He bemoans how tedious he finds people who doubt not only the effectiveness of advanced mnemonics, but how they open their mouths to criticize things they haven't tried long enough to even remotely understand. And he says to people who find the art of memory boring and tiresome that he refuses to lose temper when I'm picked at by such tiny birds as these. In other words, naysayers would do well to investigate things thoroughly before they pronounce judgment. Many other comments on those who reject the memory tradition flow throughout Dixon's writings, but He's not turning the other cheek. He's responding with love, the love of wit. And I take him at his word that he's not sour. How could any true master of memory fall into the trap of resentment at least longer than a few minutes at a time? We all do, don't we? <laughs> there is the now and only the now in pure imminence after all. And we must work to remind ourselves constantly of this fact, lest those birds peck our precious moments here on earth to pieces with their endless insults, their endless objections. So, with the idea in mind that we must clamp our critical mouths shut so that we can use our minds to organize it relative to the possibility of using the moon not just once, but potentially infinitely, let's look at where Dixon differs a little bit from what we've seen in other videos on this channel about Giordano Bruno. By the way, if you're new here, we talk about all kinds of memory. We talk about it in the ancient world. We talk about it in new science. We have lots of conversations with memory competitors who are very, very fast with their techniques. So hit that thumbs up, get subscribed, and for the love of memory, let me know what you think about all these topics in the comments, wherever you may be following the new art of memory. This is really, really important because we are part of a mnemonics renaissance, a new growth that is spurting forward all kinds of ideas about how we can use memory techniques and opportunities to use them with other people, to use them ourselves in our own progress as we learn and memorize potentially everything in the universe. That's what Bruno thinks. Bruno calls the universe something that is in a chaotic state of becoming. But Dixon calls this the absolute subject. And the absolute subject makes possible infinite categories and objects. And within those categories, we need memory systems prepped in advance so that we have a chance of remembering and understanding this gush of new data, this endless spurting of information that if we can just grab that data, we can possibly turn it into knowledge and wisdom. And so Dixon has advice on selecting your own associations, and it really all boils down to a variation on Ars Combinatoria, the art of combining images in real time as the information comes in, and then placing them in memory palaces. Now, you might inevitably ask, should you be reading Dixon? Naturally, I say yes, but I encourage you to do so only after spending at least 90 days following through the steps covered with the last memory book that you bought. Or, if you do get this one, commit to spending at least 90 days working through its implications. This is neuroscience. Your brain needs about that time of consistent reflection, taking action, reflecting on the action, in order for that solar system in your mind to orbit its chemicals around the neuro so that the neurons can build dendritic spines that are robust enough for the myelin sheaths to wrap and get entangled in them so that you actually have a brain that has dense enough white matter to keep going. This is all really well documented and studied. It is the science of habit formation. Your memory relies on it. So please commit to that. Now, of course, there are no memory palace police waiting to track you down if you stray 
from Dr. Metivier's 90-day rule, which is really the rule of all scientists of performance, just don't pick at me like one of Dixon's tiny little birds if you wind up confusing yourself. Every memory master and performance coach and memory athlete that I know, they do this for at least 90 days and then 90 days again and again and again. This teaching will be even more infinite for you when it is properly grounded in your mind. So I'm going to repeat it again and again and again. Be a completionist. Completionists win, dabblers lose. At least that's the way it works out most of the time. Dabbling has never helped me not even in my dreams. For Dixon, this teaching really boils down to being realistic about the nature of information as chaos. Whereas some teachers of the memory tradition, like Thomas Aquinas and Summa Theologica, he claims that the brain loves organization and that it is essentially possible to copy the order that God injects into the universe by forming your memory palaces in accordance with natural order. Dixon follows Bruno. The universe has no figure, no statue. Habit ergo chaos. Non statuum, non figurum, and so on, right? We talked about this in the chaos memory palace of Giordano Bruno. The universe is in a state of pure becoming. It's always becoming what it will become. You can't copy it into your mind. You can't bring its order into your mind. You are not separate from whatever it is. You are one in the same, and it comes into being with you. It is as high as it is. It is as broad as it had breadth, and it moves with its own organs. And Dixon says, by the way, I'll be throwing you out of here if you think that what we're seeking is to instill keenness of invention and skill in judgment, for you would err to no purpose. <laughs> Dramatic, right? And a little bit more than a zen slap to wake you up out of your slumber as you're reading away. But he's correct. He's taking the duelists and their gods to task. He's saying that it's not really possible to copy everything in perfect order. You can't chase after God-like status or be like God necessarily because there's too many possible ways to think about gods. That leaves you to being an insufferable being strutting around with holier-than-thou convictions. I hope I don't sound like that now. You know, in Dr. Weber's Happiness Beyond Thought, he says, it's impossible and indeed undesirable to copy your teacher. Think for yourself and think on your own about your experiments and your observations as you engage in the art of memory. Not only do you do you, but you find out that you can perceive the energy that is in fact doing you and creating the illusion that makes you think you are you along the way. And as you operate with the art of memory, you develop discernment. This is what Dixon suggests that you can do. Not the discernment that he thinks that you might want to have, but the discernment that you'll stumble upon merely through practicing discrimination. Now, we know the memory wheels can help you practice discernment and discrimination, but ultimately you have to do the work, right? You have to do the intellectual noodling, but you have to be aware that intellectual noodling, as Dixon puts it, has given rise to every quarrel that your sages have been involved in, including the ridiculous debates about whether memory techniques are natural or artificial, right? And, you know, you might not be aware of those debates, but they spend, and to this day sometimes people still talk to me about the difference between artificial and natural memory. Artificial and natural. These are binaries that appear in consciousness. They're not necessarily against themselves. What could be more natural than using your imagination? What could be more natural than using associations like the moon that appears in your mind? Why do you think there's a separation between you and your mind? Do you know the Zen story about the monk who owns nothing? He has a hut. He has some clothes. He comes home one night and he sees a thief rattling around in his home. And the thief says, oh, sorry, sorry, don't hurt me. And the monk says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm a thief. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm trying to find stuff to steal. And so the monk takes off his clothes and he says, here, have my clothes. That's all I've got. And so the thief takes the clothes and runs away. And the monk sits naked and he looks up at the moon and he says, I wish I could give that thief the moon too. He is not divided from reality. He is one and the same. He knows he can't give the thief the moon. 
but the thief has robbed himself of the opportunity. And that's because he's caught in the world of categorization, the world of dividing himself from what's out there and not seeing that what's out there appears in here, right? So unhelpful categorizations cause humans to think about the difference between the dead and the living. Truly, how can death be considered anything other than illusion when we know that Death appears in the living. It's an idea in the living. I know this is difficult to come to grips with, and you're probably thinking, what the heck does this have to do with using the moon as a memory palace? Well, I try to draw this out for you in my story learning. That's a term from Ollie Richards, who has a whole company called Story Learning. I try to draw this out in my first memory detective novel, Flyboy. During the conclusion, spoiler alert, the blind memory champion Jerome tells Detective Williams that the serial killer was aware that the opposite of being is not not being, right? That's an idea you can find also in Plato's The Sophist, if you can stand the smell of Plato. But it's impossible to really have an image of not being because not being is an image that has to exist somewhere. And the only place that we're aware of is right here and right now. And even our awareness of it, the physicists tell us, arrives later than it happened. So Dixon puts it this way, the here and now is defined by memory. Memory is what the now is, and the only thing that people lack as they navigate the now is vision. Vision for what? For discernment, for the ability to want to give the gift of the moon to the thief. Now, fortunately, Dixon has no particular vision to shove down your throat other than that, if you think it through, you will want to be the monk who wants to give the moon to the thief, but also knows that it's impossible. The thief has to want what he already has because he's not divided from it. So you're on your own <laughs> to figure it out. You always were, you always will be, and yet you're never alone because the entire universe and all the moons and all the possible configurations of where the moon might be are already represented in you. You just have to wake up to it. You have to realize it. You have to memorize the lyrics to Alice Cooper's freedom and raise your fist and yell, yes, 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 I will make mansions of the moon. So after all these mounds of philosophy, Dixon eventually moves on to teach you how to use the mansions of the moon as a kind of memory palace. Now, as far as I can tell, some of what he's talking about is derived from ancient astrology and medieval lunar calendars. And these mansions were symbolic divisions or zones along the path of the moon as it traveled through the night sky. I guess a way you could think about it, using Christian Book's beautiful art here, is, well, let's talk about this project. As I understand it, Christian may be on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast soon to help us work this out. But as I understand it, what he did is he made an image of the moon as it travels through the sky on an hour by hour basis. So if you go and look at the link that I'll have somewhere on the screen, you can check out how the project works. I've got 1 p.m but you could also get 2 p.m., you can get 3 p.m. And so you can imagine that this square, the frame, is the mansion, and that's where the moon is. And as it progresses through, so to speak, equinoxes or mansions or houses of the moon, you can have another memory palace and another memory palace and another memory palace and so forth. And let's pause upon this a little bit more because it's kind of cool and interesting. There's a philosopher named Leibniz. He said, everything possible has an urge to exist. Now, as far as I understand physics and all that stuff, and let me tell you, I use the art of memory to get some of it in my head so it can rattle around a little bit, but I'm not pretending to understand it. But as far as I understand it, Leibniz might have been switched on to something when he said this, that everything possible has an urge to exist. Because sometimes if you measure the universe, as far as I understand, you see that it's curved. So if you have an xy axis of all that energy, you can sort of see that it's curving around. But if you have even more data, that xy axis is actually flat. So as far as I understand that, you know, things are moving around and it's like reality is filling every possible quadrant with what? With the new? Well, maybe, but it seems to be building itself out of itself in a process of pure imminence. Okay, so if we keep that in mind, we could potentially fill all reality with our memory palaces 
and come to try anyway. I mean, we die, we run out of time, the meat tube does, right? But if you look at Spinoza and other philosophers, the idea is, is that information flows through our meat tubes, some of it in a kind of geographical way, or a geomorphic way, or a geological way, leaves some sediment behind. That sediment then recurses and gathers and collects and becomes new knowledge that then winds up in the minds in a sedimentary way of other people. So maybe, maybe we are just the recipients of all the knowledge of the past, and then we're going to pass it on, and death, it not being, appears in us, and then we change and we learn more and more and more about it, and we memorize more and more about it relative to our practice with memory techniques. And then, of course, we have our machines that also memorize things for us, and on and on and on. Let's take this one step further. As we imagine our little moons and the mansions of the moons constantly moving through all available space and replicating themselves as we replicate them in our minds and work through the consequences of infinite memory palettes based on infinite moons. Now, a lot of people are worried about AI right now, the paperclip problem. If an AI becomes self-aware and it has the means of production, it may turn everything in the world into a paperclip. It will essentially reproduce itself and fill all available space with itself. I would argue that we do not have to worry about this, because if reality is already producing itself out of itself, and this xy axis is constantly expanding in both a curved way and with enough data in a flat way, well, reality is already filling all available space with itself. So why worry? Why worry at all? This is what all the great sages say. Now, 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 and only now, and a now that's built out of itself. Now, yes, of course, we have problems, we have suffering, and all that sort of stuff, but scale out, back, 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 and you find out that, you know, your little life is pretty insignificant in the grand scale of things, and yet, at the same time, without contradiction, this is a dialetaism, the consequences of which are paraconsistencies, we also are fully and completely just beautiful and profoundly important as individuals. And when we don't remove separation between ourselves and others, we wish to give the moon to the thieves, we are free so wonderfully and gloriously free to play around with the astrological signs, the lunar phases, and the corresponding celestial influences, just as long as we have our brains open and not so open that our minds fall out. Because, you know, are we really influenced by the astral bodies? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know, that's up to you. But if you use your discernment, this is what I think Dixon is getting at, and Bruno before him, and all the great memory masters, whether they think in terms of duality or they think in terms of non-duality, they're trying to tell you that now, 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 and it is glorious and insignificant at the same time. Both things are true without contradiction. So based on this idea, Dixon describes how to use these mansions of the moon as a kind of mnemonic set of locators, as a kind of astral memory palace. And you can do this yourself. Now, you're going to have to go and learn the mansions of the sky if you want to do this. And this book is excellent, The Hermetic Art of Memory. So go and grab a copy while you're on your way to the internet to get yourself one of the moons of Darwin and make it your mission to have a distinct location or even a room within a memory palace in which you start to work with the moon. You know, if th resources were unlimited, I would have this all over the place and I would just try to work out some sort of thing where this painting is reproduced in the different colors that Christian Book has it and have it placed in a certain way. But I can also mentally do it in my mind and populate my walls with different versions of this art and then use it as a reference point as a memory palace. And, you know, you can leverage if you know different things about the moon's symbolism to give it attributes that enhance your encoding and retrieval. So, for example, if you wanted to memorize a series of philosophical concepts, you could assign each concept to a corresponding lunar mansion. By incorporating the mansions of the moon into your art of memory, which is an art when you use it, you can turn a substantial part of space itself into a memory palace. And this expansion offers more than a merely broader and more diverse landscape for memorization. You can also follow the same patterns that we've talked about many times on this channel before. Because you can copy the mansions of the moon multiple times, 
each copy taking you further and further out into space in as many directions as you wish. You can also place memory palaces on one moon itself and on every moon that you reproduce in a different space on the XY axis of space. And if you know Bruno's infinite statues, which we talked about in the Chaos Memory Palace of Giordano Bruno, you can have statues that come loaded with magnetic pockets. So to rehearse that briefly, each statue in Bruno's theory has 30 stations. I use 10, it's a much simpler way of doing it. And then the 11th station is a little magnetic pocket. So if we had an Aristotle statue right here behind me, he would have 10 stations and then the 11th station would be a pocket. Inside of Aristotle's pocket would be a statue of Bruno and Bruno would have 10 stations and then he would have a pocket and inside of that pocket there would be Cicero, Cicero, right? And then inside of Cicero's pocket would be Dixon. And these statues could go on and on and on into infinity. But not only that, they could also have in their minds the mansions of the moon. And in their minds, they could reproduce the mansions of the moon on and on and on into infinity. And you don't have to limit yourself to the moon. Imagine having multiple memory palaces loaded with statues on all of those planets that they say are out there, you know, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and on and on and on. Let's say you memorize the seven planets of the classical solar system as part of just studying Hermeticism, right? Now, each of those planets can have moons that circle them, and they can also have statues in which those statues have imaginations that are also populated with moons. The infinite memory palace technique is extraordinary and glorious. Even if you don't use it, it's really, really good to work it through in your mind. And then of course, you can change the colors if you want to reproduce them conceptually. So your first set of classical planets and moons that circle the classical planets, that set could be blue. The next set could be green. The next set could be orange and yellow. Now I alphabetize the order of the colors, but you could just as well use Roy G. Biv. And you could repeat Roy G. Biv again and again and again, but in order to distinguish the next Roy G. Biv from the first one, you could have a cloud version. You could have a fire version next, and then an ice version, a stone version, and on and on and on and on. If you want to work this through a little bit more in your mind, my next book, or maybe it'll be my next book I release, I don't know, I got so many books ready to go and in various states of reparation and preparation and so forth. It's called The Infinite Memory Palace Technique of Giordano Bruno. If you'd like to be notified when it goes live, raise your hand by going to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash GB. GB stands for Giordano Bruno, and you will be the first to know when it's ready. Usually I have little special things for people who are on the notification list, and indeed I have something in mind. Okay, so you're going to use spheres and planets, and there's no reason why you can't also project memory wheels, if you know that technique, out into space. So if you've followed along on previous videos that I've put out there about the wrap memory wheel exercise, you could put that out in space and you could have different versions of it going out on and on and on and on and in different colors and made of different substances. And you can just project those memory wheels onto different planets so you have a frame of references. Now, if all of this has melted your mind and you find it difficult to imagine infinite space and copying endless sequences of planets into it and you know you want to be able to do this so you can memorize cool terms like pure imminence and all that try this little mental exercise to see if it helps you out now this exercise is not an explanation of david hilbert's infinite hotel concept it is just an exercise based on it what i want you to do is imagine a hotel with infinite rooms space is needed for one more guest so you ask everyone to move down one room, and they do. And if you can't visualize hotel rooms extending into infinity and making room for one more person, don't worry about this. Just ask yourself how it feels to try to comprehend what I'm saying. And you know, you won't be alone if you can't do it. I actually can't do it. I'm not even sure Bruno could do it. As he says at the beginning of his book, 30 Statues, he says, there is no figure for chaos, which he means reality coming into being for all infinity. Yet, he's astonished that even though we can't make a memory palace to fit all this stuff in, we can't make a statue that would cover all of infinity and all the information that could 
eventually be memorized by one brain. Weirdly enough, we can think about it, we can talk about it as I'm talking to you about it now. And we just need to realize that we are basing it all on endless manipulations of a limited alphabet and a small set of numbers, really zero to nine, that just repeat infinitely in different configurations. And the alphabet, let's just say in English, 26 letters. These letters just combine and combine and combine to make infinite sentences, or at least potentially infinite sentences. There's a little idea that Bruno seems to have, which is that information appears in infinity at a certain point of time. So that means that infinity extends into the past, and without a time machine, all of our production of infinite sentences will never fill the past, so we don't have to worry necessarily that our information is going to <laughs> fill all of infinity, just part of it. So what you're experiencing is not a limit on your imagination if you struggle to run these experiments. What you're experiencing is expansion itself, the stretching of your own consciousness as you bump up against what only feels like a boundary, but is in fact pure becoming. It is the experience of pure imminence. So let's lean into it. After you play around with Hilbert's hotel and move everyone down one room to accommodate one new guest, imagine this scenario. Have everyone move two rooms down instead of just one. When you do that, you have effectively doubled infinity. Now here's another exercise suggested by something that I read in Adrian Moore's The Infinite. I think of it as the Christmas paradox. I'm not sure I understood what he's saying there, but this is how it rattled around in my cage. Imagine that one man is in heaven and another man is in hell. Every Christmas, they are required to switch places and spend the entire day in the opposite location. If you don't like heaven and hell, you could have it be the moon that circles our planet and the other one, the moon that circles some other planet. In other words, no matter where you place this, the man in heaven descends to hell for 24 hours, while the man in hell gets to go to heaven during the exact same period. Now, if infinity is real, is it not the case that each man spends the exact same amount of time in both heaven and hell? I don't know, it melts my mind, but that seems to be the implication. These exercises matter because doubling infinity in your mind and extending antiquated solar systems into infinity, well, Dixon himself says that you are a gatekeeper of memory, or at least you can be. You're the intellect which can extend itself towards those things that have moved and will seek to envelop all of possibility. And you can try to retain as much of it as you want, but since all of reality obviously is not going to be contained in the mind of one meat tube, you have to use discernment and you have to make an exceptional effort to do so, so that you choose to focus on memorizing the information that matters. And since information is so repetitive, set theory shows us that information will basically recurse. It will build itself from itself, form patterns, and let's do another infinite exercise. If you take a million, this is from P.D. Joule, by the way, in a book called Interpretation. If you take a million reviews of Sense and Sensibility, you're not going to have a million unique responses. What you're going to have are patterns that develop. He suggests three to five categories of interpretation of this one text. So we really don't actually have to try to memorize it all. What we need to do is use our memory to develop pattern recognition. And this helps us prevent the patterns from passing away. And we use discernment to navigate the world and try to move from one island to the next island and ideally land upon islands that please us, and then please us more and more, and then yet more still. So by entangling yourself with the challenge of learning the art of memory, you will experience what they call growth. And I don't mean growth without an end necessarily, but you will, as I talked about recently with Tensil Le on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, you'll be able to break through plateaus. And when you use the art of memory, your memory palaces and all the associations within them, they will fade away. 
You can, in fact, sweep them away like so many wood shavings on the floor of your mental workshop. The memories you have are created and they can remain, but they don't necessarily need to because pattern recognition, as you continue to read and absorb, will have this geological function where sediment will form and more sediment will be added for as long as you live. And then data becomes knowledge that becomes wisdom. And better still, you can lose yourself in the process. I believe this is what the art of memory is about at large. Dixon says this quickened power of the mind and a carefully achieved loosening of the mind from the body. I don't think Dixon means this captivating learning tool of the mansions of the moon is a way to literally merge yourself with the celestial and the terrestrial realms. It's a means of experiencing what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi called flow, which opens you up to observing and, uh, and enjoying further avenues for exploration because you're switched on to it. So Dixon ends his training in the art of memory with a Yoda-esque call to action and a careful adherence to the laws that govern your memory, the way the laws govern memory in every meat tube, except for with some variation if you've had traumatic brain injury or some other thing that might cause issues. But we all have issues of one form or another, so even in the presence of issues, you keep moving forward. You say yes, and you do, and you do, and you do, and you cannot do not, because as Yoda reminds us, there is no try. Why do all of the gurus always point that out? Well, there's some force inside of them that causes them to point it out. Pure imminence, perhaps. What happens next is up to you and is not up to you at the same time. It depends on your intensive study your practice and hard work to ensure that nothing can escape your attention so that everything sinks in. This is a subject that requires special dedication, Dixon tells us, and you must always abide by its rules. The only problem I see here is both scientific and philosophical. So the implications of what I see as non-duality in Bruno and many other philosophers is that our contemporary neuroscience suggests that your sensation of having a you is an illusion. And so, you know, how do we, how do we deal with this? I don't necessarily know other than if you want to give the moon to the thief, you have to stamp out this nasty sulfurous fire of thinking that you are a I and that you have a me. And so I think Dixon is right that memory training can create a loosening of the mind from the body. And for myself, I just keep practicing and I combine philosophy with memory-based meditation and I'm not sure one works without the other. You know, speaking of Christian Book, I've memorized a little bit of a thing that he performs marvelously called Ursanata. It's something like oomph, bava, tetse, oomph, paga, whee, or quee. It, you know, it's just the most amazing thing in the world. And his performance is top notch. Does it have any sort of content the same way that the Sanskrit that I've memorized has philosophy in it? No, but it has that same feeling of getting into flow. Just playing with it now feels good. So you memorize stuff that makes you feel good and you recall it and it helps loosen the hold of the ego over the body and the hold of the body over the ego. And so moons, moons and more moons yet. This is something that anybody can do. If you enjoyed this, hit that thumbs up, get subscribed if you aren't already. And we're going to talk more about the ancient art of memory, more with memory competitors, more with all kinds of science influencing us, helping us shatter this idea that there is an I, and yet enjoy how it appears in the dream, if it is indeed a dream. And ideally, we will shatter the binary that makes us think that there is a difference between sleep and wakefulness, and perhaps even we will learn to give the thief the moon, or at least the ability to realize that the moon was always already in him. If you want to carry on and you haven't seen the chaos memory palace of Giordano Bruno, go ahead and watch that next. And I await that moment when I will be able to hand you the opportunity to acquire 
the book, The Infinite Memory Palace Technique of Giordano Bruno. And when you do, maybe I'll acquire another moon. Just kidding, magnetic friends. We've all already got the moon. You just have to seize it and put it into use.